Welcome to a tutorial video on Twine 2.6. In this video, I'm going to discuss managing inventory with data structures in Harlow 3.3. Across the last few videos, I have covered the different data structures available in Harlow. We've discussed arrays, we've discussed data sets, and data maps. In this video, I'm going to show an approach, four different approaches that is, for using these different data structures to solve the same general problem. And we're going to look at the kind of benefits and potential pitfalls for using these different data structures within Harlow. So let's start with first describing the scenario. This scenario is that a reader must interact with four different items in, in, in order to leave an area. This is a pretty common scenario. We find a lot of interactive stories and also within video games as well. The reader or player, depending on what we want to describe, the person interacting with what we're making, needs to do something, and once they've done all those things, or collected something, or talked to a certain number of people, then they can leave the area or otherwise progress the story. So we've got four different things that the user needs to do, or in this case the reader in form, in the case of our interactive stories, and we want to prepare four different approaches for setting this up, three using data structures, one using variables. So let me go ahead and go through what I have here. I'm going to go ahead and start with this passage called mini variable start. So I've set up four different passages using the keywords true and false. So these are carried over from the parent language JavaScript and just equivalent to zero and one. So right here I've set item one, item two, item three, and item four. So four different story-wide variables all to an initial value of false. Then when we move over to many variables area, we notice that when all of them are true, when all four things have been interacted with, or in this case picked up, then we can access the exit passage. So moving to room one, we see that we've something we see a pattern that we've seen multiple times in other videos working with single values within variables. In this case, we're checking to see if item one is false, and if it is, then we can go ahead and interact using the link macro, and it will set item one to true. Once this happens, item one is no longer false, and then the reader won't be presented with the same choice again. So let's go ahead and play from this point just to see what this looks like. So we have four different rooms and we can pick up an item or not in each corresponding room. I will go ahead and do that. And then once we've done it, we no longer have access to pick that up. And once I have all four and I return to this area, I can then exit. So working with many variables is a completely valid approach to tracking multiple information within an interactive story within Twine. Potentially, we could create as many variables as we want, use temporary variables and story-wide variables to achieve the same goal. But as we've been discussing data structures across the last few videos, we need to think about ways that we can convert this same idea into new patterns that might be helpful depending on what we're doing. So as we transition our thinking across this video, let's move from the many variables approach to working with an array. And I will go ahead and move the start passage over here. So remember when we work with arrays, that arrays follow a number of different rules. When we think about arrays, we have two general questions we can ask. At this position, what is the value? And does this array contain this particular value? Remember when we talk about arrays, generally we care about the sequence. In what order are they? And what is the position of particular values? So in this case, I've gone ahead and created an empty array just using the, in this case, the A macro right here to create an empty array. And then each time, like we just saw in the previous approach, I'm going to now add to the existing array, which is something we can do when we work with arrays. However, we have to keep in mind the rule that only arrays can affect arrays. So while we're working with arrays, we are constantly creating them and adding them together, which is perfectly fine. So over here in room one, notice I'm using something a little bit different. I'm using does not contain. Now previously we saw if we want to check for inclusivity, that is, is something included, we can use contains if item array contains something. In this case, I want the opposite. And so I'm using other keywords, does not contain, which is the opposite of contains. So in this case, if item array does not contain item one, then it allows us to, right here, add it to the existing array by creating an array with a single entry and then adding it to the existing array. 
This acts in the same way that we just saw the true and false in the previous approach. So notice we're still using the same ideas, but we're converting them into a different approach. And this is repeated across these three other rooms. So over here in room area, we can now use the keyword contains if the item array contains this, and contains this, and contains this, and contains this, then we can finally move over to the exit. And so starting the story over on this particular passage, we see the same thing we just saw. I can pick up an item or not in each individual room. And finally, once I have all four, I can exit. So comparing the many variable approach to the array approach, we don't really notice that much of a change. The keywords are different and the concepts are slightly more complicated with an array, although not too much so. But we've noticed that we've gone from four different story-wide variables to just a single story-wide variable. In this case, we're just using, using item array instead of item one, item two, item three, and item four. So, one of the benefits of using an array for this particular purpose is it would give us one variable, one kind of bucket, that we could then put things in and check against. And potentially, if we're working with a large number of things within an inventory that we're managing, an array might be a great choice if we want to be able to put things in, potentially take things out, although I didn't show it in this particular example, and again, thinking about does this array contain a particular value. So let's transition over to the last two data structures we have available in Harlow. Again, we have access to arrays, access to data sets, and access to a data map. A data set works very similar to an array in its setup, which is to say we can create an empty data set. Now remember, when we work with data sets, it has one more rule than arrays. That is, it has an incredible strictness policy. We can only use unique values within a data set. We can't have repeating values. In an array, that's fine. In a data set, we can't do that. The other thing we need to remember with data sets is we don't have access to positions. We don't know what order they are in, and nor can we access them in whatever order that they might be in. So order is not important, but uniqueness is. Now, when we work with data sets, we have to abide by the same rule we saw with arrays. Only arrays affect arrays. Only data sets affect data sets. The good news, though, is that we can continue the use of the keywords I just covered previously for an array. So does not contain and contains are still used for keywords we can use. Notice that if I want to add something to a data set, I have to create a data set. Again, remembering only data sets affect data sets. Now, if we start from this passage over here, we will notice it looks incredibly similar to the last two approaches. This is a data set, and then notice we can go into any of these rooms, pick up the items, move through the rooms, and finally, once we've picked up all four and returned back, we can finally exit. Now, we notice in particular, moving across these different approaches, they're not too different. And I've purposely made this example in such a way that we could see this. Remember, though, there are some special kind of rules and pitfalls for each data structure. With array, we get the ability to get access to position if we want it. What is the position of this value? For data sets, we don't get that, but we care much more about strictness. Is this unique or not? So let's move over to the last data structure and then talk about them in conversation with each other. So, so far we've looked at many variables. We've looked at possible using array, using a data set, and now let's get a data map. And again, all of these are valid. They just all come with different kind of benefits and potential problems. So working with a data map, we can return to a very similar setup we saw way back in the first approach of using multiple variables. In this case, when we work with a data map, we do pairs of things, a name with a value. We need to use the name to get access to the value. And we create them again in pairs. So pair one, pair two, pair three, and pair four. But notice, instead of four different variables, I have one variable, again, thinking about the bucket as something we put in them. We have a single bucket with four different names that we can then use to access those values. Notice in this case that any time we want to correspondingly access the value, we need that name. Again, data maps are focused on name value pairs. So in the case of wanting to know if something has a particular value, we then use the possessive S 
English construct within Harlow. So if item data's item one is false, then we can set item data's item one to true. Notice we're still using this English possessive S as we're setting this up. But looking at this particular setup using data maps is not too dissimilar that we saw in the first approach using variables. Again, all of these approaches are very similar. We're just kind of adjusting each thing for each corresponding data structure. And now this pattern we saw in data map room one is repeated across these other rooms. Finally, coming back over here, we see the exact same thing. If item data maps item one is true, item two is true, item three is true, and item four is true, then finally we can go to the accent. Now, remember when we work with data maps, it's a little like gluing a data set to an array. The names have to be unique, but the values can potentially be repetitive if we need them to. But in this particular setup, if we start the story from all the way over here, we see the exact same thing all over again. Notice we pick up an item, we return, and then once we have all four, we can finally go to the exit. And there we go. So what's unique about this particular example? Well, I wanted to point out that there are some cases where you could potentially use any data structure and it wouldn't really matter as long as you remember the corresponding rules for that data structure. We also need to remember if we're working with arrays, data sets, or data maps, that each of them only work with themselves. Arrays affect arrays, data sets affect data sets, data maps affect data maps. However, if we wanted to, instead of working with all these other data structures, we could potentially just use many variables. Again, each approach is completely valid within Harlow. There's no one that is better than the other. There are just some that are better at certain use cases than others. If we were only interested in things that were unique, the data set might be the best choice. If we were interested in the position of things, the array might be the better choice. If we had a large number of names we were mapping to values, things like health or stamina or a number of other statistics, then a data map might be the best choice. Although potentially, again, we could use many variables. So all of these are valid choices, but we need to constantly remember, as we were with data structures in Harlow, each of them come with, again, benefits, potential problems, that we need to keep in mind as we work with them. Some are slightly better than the others, depending on use cases, but there are some scenarios, like I propose in this particular extended example, where it doesn't really matter as long as we understand the rules governing the data structures in our management of inventory in Harlow 3.3 and Twine 2.6. Thanks for watching.